Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. It's good to have you back today. We've been having a good time. Molly's back. She had taken an extended tour up someplace near the, um, the wine region of California, really to work on her cyclotron work and stuff like that. And Eric and Tim were excited because they've got a really good night planned uh, out, at, out, at the, out in the Sierras where their teles remote telescopes are. Most importantly, Chris Barr is here with us. Now, Chris is, a, Chris is a man that has decided that he's going to pack up all his stuff and take it with him when he goes out observing, and he's not going to have to repack all the time. He's got he's built himself a photon chasseur and, or something like that. I don't know. I don't speak photon. Um, and he is going to uh, tell us all about how he did it, how he made it up, and why it's a really cool thing to have. And I as I usually do for five minutes, even though it some, some seems like 15 or 20 to the people in the room. Um, I am going to share my screen for a little bit and tell you about what's coming up in the near future so I can get you to, to um, uh, participate. Here we got Chris. Oops. Here we got uh, Chris's. Um, uh, this is tonight what's actually coming up live. Don't forget over here. You guys enter all your questions and stuff like that, and we will refer them over to Chris so that he can answer all your questions about whatever you've got um, to know about tonight's presentation. And there's various other things you can do in here, including subscribe to the channel. We would like you to subscribe to the channel so that you can get contacts and find out what's happening. I also like to share with you the calendar so that you'll know that next week we are going to take a break. We are going to take a break because it's Super Bowl Sunday and, you know, high holy days. You can't really, you, you got to go along with the flow. So uh, instead of doing the Astro Imaging Channel, we will be watching the Bengals and the Rams play over at SoFi Stadium. And we've got a pretty good schedule coming up for you, but we do have some blanks coming up. Um, May 15th is the next time we need a presenter. So please get yourself organized and uh, become a presenter. I would like to talk about a couple of other things that are on the schedule of importance. Um, the first is, is the, TA, the TAIC workshop. This is where we've got Terry's data. And I'm going to introduce um, Rory here. I'm going to stop sharing. And Rory's going to come on and tell you a little bit about that and another project that he's involved with, with the Astro Imaging Channel, where he talk, talks about Facebook. So Rory, if you can uh, go ahead and take over. you guys hear me okay we can hear you fine yep all right and can you see my screen okay yeah all right so uh if you're not part of the astro imaging channel on facebook uh i would encourage you to head over there and subscribe and you can get notifications about upcoming shows and we also have a facebook astro imaging group two different uh uh sites to subscribe to on facebook one's the announcements and one one group is where you could post pictures and you can see pictures that uh other group members have posted as well get some feedback and whatnot be part of the community and then if you head over to the astro imaging uh channel.org you can see our uh, workshop that we're talking about uh, with terry's data and you could download that there and if you uh, if you want to edit that image and send that in, you could submit that here where it says submit finished image. Um, by the way, it's this bottom link when you head over to the workshop. Uh, I could get back to you and um, e we'll either ask you to uh, present for five minutes or we'll uh, upload your finished image uh, on the presentation on March 27th. So would love to have you submit uh, your images there. And um, that's all I have for tonight. So I uh, hope everyone's doing well and look forward to the presentation tonight. Okay, thank you very much. Now, um, there's one other thing we've got to tell you about while we're while we're over here and I got to get back over to that screen. And Uh, as you know, Arno has been hard at work making uh, 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 videos for us. When you folks turn in your, um, turn in your, oh, this is the tech, TAIC um, shots project that uh, Arno's involved in. Uh, and this, um, this time around, we're doing the solar system. 
So if you could send in your best image of the solar systems, you know, be creative, combine your photographs, amaze your audience, you know, do whatever you want to do as long as it's in our solar system, take some pictures and um, submit them. And then we'll put them together into one of these beautiful uh, 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 videos with music and all that other cool stuff. Now, the way you do that is you go ahead and uh, pick your pictures, process them as, as you like, and then click here to submit, and you'll just send them in. Arno will get them, and he'll put them together and make your make the video for us. And you've got some timelines on that. Uh, this is from um, uh, up until April 3rd. You have to have them in to us, so get them in as, as soon as you can. And uh, Rory, when was your... Um, when was your workshop? When was your workshop supposed to be in? Um, March. So we only got about oh, a little more than a month to get that one in. Okay, yeah. The, so the date to submit March 13th. The presentation's on the 27th. Yeah. But it takes a little bit of time to get us organized and stuff. So get it in as quickly as you can. And I think we've got all the announcements. Don't forget to volunteer if you uh, would like to be a presenter on the Astro Imaging channel or if you have any suggestions about what we need to do differently, please get them in here. We do like to listen to you. And remember, we're just a bunch of people doing Astro Imaging. That's all we're doing. We're having fun doing it. And we like to share what we're doing. And I know about Chris Barr, who would like to share with us a little bit about his photon chasseur. Chris, it's your turn. Take it away. All right, uh, let's see. Get Sharon here. You're sharing. Uh, you you got that good? Your, yeah, now you got your display screen the way it belongs. Okay. Right. Excellent. Well, good evening, everybody. And um, I am going to talk about uh, a project uh, or a series of projects that I did over the last year. Um, to build a mobile astrophotography studio. A um, couple disclaimers before I dive in. Um, I am an amateur astrophotographer in training. I will emphasize the in training part. I was sitting here thinking about it. You know, I started this hobby back in 04. And if, uh, you know, it's all about telescope time. And if I look at so how much time over that span I've actually spent doing astrophotography, I mean, I'm, I'm probably the equivalent of somebody who's really intense at it for less than four years. So uh, that gives you some sense of my experience level and it's all broken up over that time frame. Um, and by the same token, I, I am not a master craftsman, nor am I a, an engineer by trade. So um, I, I tend to solve things uh, pragmatically or simply. Uh, so keep that in mind as you, as you see my project and as I talk through it. Um, and by all means, if you have any questions um, or comments, please um, put them in the chat. So with that said, um, why photon chaser? Why not photon chaser? Well, as it turns out, uh, probably half the landscape photographers with DSLRs in the world call themselves online photon chasers. So I was looking for something a little more unique. I pulled out the thesaurus and I found the uh, French word chasseur, uh, which is a light cavalryman equipped and trained for rapid movement, also means hunter it seemed appropriate for what I was going for. Uh, so I'm mostly going to talk about, well, I'm going to talk a lot about my journey in this hobby tonight. Um, this particular stopover on the journey and why you might care. How did I get here? What I like about it? How and why I built it? What I do with it? A little bit about what I might do next uh, and hopefully answer some of your questions. Um, on this slide, I've tried to illustrate my journey a little bit, uh, some of the highlights. You know, National Geographic back in the 90s and the Hubble Space Telescope images are really what inspired me to jump into the hobby. Um, I bought my first telescope in 2004. It was a Me DTX 125. And by the end of 2004, uh, I was deep into astrophotography learning curve. Uh, and I guess I'm still there. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, I, I like this picture because this is actually from the winter of 2004. Um, so unfortunately, my enthusiasm really started to ramp up in autumn of 2004. And it was a rough winter in Chicago, Illinois that year, which is where I was at the time under the big orange light dome. And, uh, 
you know, I, I just wanted to learn it so bad. And so th this was a typical training session for me. You can see the folded up laptop on the table there. And I remember it didn't want to work real well at five degrees Fahrenheit. So, um, you know, the, the big warning, read the fine print, astrophotography is hard. And that's a good illustration. Um, so what problems uh, was I, am I trying to solve here? Um, so I found that that setup and teardown was just taken too long. Uh, each each uh, each time I wanted to engage with the hobby, there was there was all this kind of overhead time that wasn't spent doing what I was hoping to be doing. Um, each new setup, you know, had to be tested and usually troubleshot because you're doing it from scratch again. You know, cables don't connect right, whatever things aren't tightened down properly. Um, and then the wear and tear on the equipment and me, um, and I, you know, I've always, while I've been doing this hobby, I've been in the suburbs of, of major cities. And so if you want to improve your sky conditions, you know, you're buying into a full camping trip, all the trimming, set up, tear down, uh, and, and, or, you know, the alternative, you know, some dangerous bleary, I drive home, you know, at 5 AM, um, and, uh, I'm, I'm also somebody who finds it uncomfortable to use a laptop outside in the dark. Um, I find they don't, they don't like cold. They don't like moisture. Um, and neither do I. Uh, and I, I just want to be where it's warm or mosquito free. Uh, and I also found that I am a better imager. Uh, and an imager is really uh, a glorified troubleshooter most of the time. Uh, but I do that better when I'm relaxed. Um, and I've also kind of eyed this this hobby uh, as as a uh, you know a big part of my retirement. So I want to kind of get a better sense of of do I yeah do I really want to do that in my retirement? So the flip side of any problem solving is what problems am I not trying to create? Um, so I don't want to break anything. Been there, done that. Um, I don't want to buy something off the shelf and then find it doesn't do exactly what I want to do. And then I'm over modifying. Uh, I don't want to buy it off a, a build it from scratch project that, that I just don't have the skills or the know how to complete. Um, I don't want to spend a lot without an exit strategy. Um, I looked at uh, a couple of, of, you know, big ideas like toy haulers. There are some beautiful RV toy haulers out there, but I drive a Subaru Outback. So I knew I wasn't going to be able to do that without going all in on a new truck, which would be great. You know, put a big grin on my face for a little while. Um, and so I was trying to avoid that. Um, definitely didn't want any safety issues. And, you know, the last thing was, and you'll notice I've kind of kept the power solution pretty straightforward and simple. I just, I just, I'd like, to be able to go off grid, but I'm not ready to take that on yet. And I think that can potentially add a lot of cost to the project. So it was just something I, I consciously said, I'm not going to do that up front. All right. So why a dolly in a trailer? So the dolly part of this solution um, really just kind of gets me that, that fast, easy setup, consistent every time. Uh, there's a reliability there. I don't have to troubleshoot it each time if I leave it alone on the dolly. Um, and it, it really, is, um, I, was, I was hoping the increased frequency of, of uh, engagement with the hobby and the enjoyment factor, uh, and also be able to work with heavier and larger setups without you know, all the grunt work. Um, and then on the trailer side, really it's about kind of getting to, to better skies and being able to take uh, uh, you know, my shelter, my overnight uh, accommodations and uh, my remote imaging workspace out there with me and be able to be set up in just a matter of moments. So just a little bit about me. Uh, I grew up in a small town in Pens eastern Pennsylvania. Um, I'm a veteran in the U.S. Navy. Uh, I've got four children, five grandchildren. Um, as my day job, I do uh, data governance and data warehousing in the insurance industry. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, Hubble in, in Nat Geo in the 90s is really what kind of lit the fuse for me uh, in this hobby. Uh, I'm not going to go through all this, don't worry. Uh, but I think we all have one of these kind of gear timelines like, 
uh, we, we sort of tell our story in the hobby by, by what gear we bought and sold when. Um, and so there, there are some events on here though, that sort of help tell the story of how I got to where I did. Um, you know, back in 06, I bought a Zeiss APQ 130, which was just a phenomenal telescope. Um, in, uh, 2007, uh, I had a burglary. Some of my astronomy equipment got stolen, thankfully not the Zeiss. Um, and uh, I was also dabbling in remote imaging back in 07. And it, it was not an easy proposition. It's, it's not easy now, but it was a lot harder then. And uh, in the process, uh, I ended up having a cable wrap incident on my EM200. And uh, it didn't end well and uh, really did a lot of damage to my mount. Um, so, uh, led to eventually a hiatus, uh, from imaging and the hobby for quite a while, the better part of eight years, I, I was kind of disengaged, uh, until 17, um, I bought a four inch lunt, uh, hydrogen alpha scope, uh, daytime astronomy, right? It's, uh, it's easy. You're, you're not out there fumbling in the dark. And, uh, you know, I got into solar imaging. And, uh, you know, the fuse was lit again for me. And uh, so in 2018, I got on the list for a Mach 1 from astrophysics, really looking to replace uh, uh, my uh, Takahashi mount. Um, and, uh, you know, from there, it's kind of been up and up and up and up on the, on the astrophotography side. So that's sort of my gear, gear story. Uh, that's sort of the backdrop of all of this. So... When I uh, started looking, thinking about the dolly, uh, really was shortly after getting the AP mount. And uh, in uh, November of 2020, you know, I guess we were, what, like seven, eight months into COVID lockdown, um, I, I started to get the itch to do a project. And I was, I was looking at some of the commercial offerings for dollies. I mean, they're out there. Um, I even spec that, I spec one out, kind of had one configured that would support the the Mach 1 on the Eagle. And um, I just I just came to the conclusion I thought I could build something better for less money. Um, so I, I kind of jumped into designing that and, and, and coming up with my approach. And it really focused on stability and safety. You know, I didn't want to didn't want to damage anything again. You know, really nice equipment, don't want to do damage to it. So I uh, just really stuck on that sort of center line of kind of keep things stable and safe. Um, I sourced all my parts uh, really from local hardware stores, Amazon and Granger. The dolly required one weld uh, to do, and uh, that was actually donated to me by a, a friendly uh, local manufacturer. Uh, and uh, I did unfortunately have to sacrifice one aluminum canoe paddle, which I'll get into. I did extensive testing uh, and really I was looking to try some remote imaging again. And this, this I felt would become kind of the cornerstone of that. So uh, I'll jump into sort of the, the construction and features and uh, how I went about this. So lumber wise, it's, it's all just two by sixes. The T-frame the is two by six, one by six reinforcements and, uh, and then uh, four by six on the riser over, over here. You'll see the, the riser in the front. Uh, for fasteners, I use mostly lag screws and glue. Um, wheels, uh, this this is a, a shot of the front wheel as it came stock. Uh, I sourced this from Amazon. It is a nine inch king cutter finish mower wheel assembly modified. Uh, so why did I do that? Well, what attracted me to it is it had the fork assembly already attached to it. Um, and I thought, well, that, that saves me a lot of kind of noodling on how I'm going to do that. Uh, so it kind of comes fully assembled like this. The only problem was this was at an angle. So I ended up cutting this off, flipping it, you know, turning it 180 degrees and then having it welded on. So it was straight up and down uh, at, at an angle like this. Obviously, as a front wheel, if you, if you turned the wheel, it would throw the, the center of balance off and, and probably spill over. Um, so it was important for it to be straight up and down. That worked out well. And... Uh, ended up using solid tires uh, on all three points. People ask, why didn't you use pneumatic? And I said, you know, I've, I've never had those small pneumatic tires on anything where they weren't 
kind of always flat. So just didn't want the headache of having to always fill up tires. And it turns out they, they worked out great, the solid tires. Um, for axles, it's a 5.8 steel rod here. Um, these wheelbarrow axle brackets are actually at the corners uh, and just kind of bent them at a right angle, uh, fastening that axle on. Then there's, uh, I mounted these all the way to the back here, uh, really for stability. And uh, I put these spacers in to give it a little springiness and it softens the ride a little bit. Uh, and then on to fasten the wheels, these are just uh, five eighth retention collars on the outside and the inside. Um, and you can kind of get a, a, a sense here for how I'm leveling it. The levelers. Um, so, so these are were kind of perhaps one of the most critical parts of the dolly. Um, I mean, when you're actually set up and imaging, these are the feet. This is what's coming into contact with the ground. This is what's going to give you either a stable or an unstable platform. Um, so uh, I went with a fake threaded stock. These are 5 eighths by 7 inch um, with an acorn nut at the top. I, I JB welded that on there. Uh, and then these bottom parts, these are actually heavy duty machine levelers I got from Granger. It's kind of a ball joint in here. Um, and uh, they're, they're pretty substantial width here. I want to say it's about two and a half, three inches wide at the bottom. Uh, and so just a really nice solid footing. Uh, and then the final piece of that was these uh, five eighths threaded inserts. I used two, one on each side of the board um, so you don't have any wobbling at all. Uh, and that gave gave just a, a great solid plan. And you'll see here too that uh, I'm using just an 18 volt drill to kind of run my levelers in and out. It's actually a lot of fun to set up. Uh, the whole thing sets up in in just you know moments. You wheel it out to where you want, uh, put the leveling blocks underneath it, and then just uh, level up. Uh, uh, the Mach One has a, a built-in level and compass on it, so it's really easy to sort of get it close. Um, I will say this, the Eagle Pier was probably the catalyst for all these ideas. I mean, really, if not for the Eagle Pier, I don't know if any of this ever would have happened. Uh, but I bought the, the uh, astrophysics mount with the Eagle Pier. I was just so impressed with the build quality and the design of the Eagle. Then that's what kind of inspired. I'm like, you know, this thing could be easily sort of anchored to something and be super solid for mobility. Um, I had been reading uh, stories, horror stories actually on uh, some of the forums about people who have used dollies to move their equipment and made big mistakes, you know, <laughs> you know big uh, uh, SCTs toppling over and smashing to bits on driveways and things like that i you know so i was like i i need to avoid all that and uh uh so i was really looking for that a way to anchor it to the dolly quite securely and uh the eagle the eagle really lent itself to that so i ended up making these uh anchors that fit right in the slots here you can see uh and then uh, uh the turnbuckles uh, to tighten it down, and then also kind of a foot box for each of the eagle's feet, so it can't slide laterally. Uh, handle just uh, this was the the sacrifice Coleman canoe paddle. Just sawed it off, uh, put a wood core in it, made a little homemade U joint here, and then attach that to the top of the shaft for the front wheel. Um, it maneuvers quite easily. It, it can turn actually on, on its own footprint. Um, so it's, it's very easy to position in a tight spot. So uh, all the while, while I was building this, you know, you just don't know how effective your solution is going to be. So testing is key. Um, again, didn't want to break anything. So I went about this as carefully and methodically as I could. Um, my first test was to, to fasten the eagle on there and literally pick the dolly up by the eagle sideways, holding it sideways and shake it vigorously to see what would happen. And I was able to, to do that without any movement at all of the dolly uh, or the eagle. So everything was super solid. Um, 
I, I would at this, I guess it's a good time to kind of point this out. I would only recommend this, I can only recommend this approach for the Eagle or something similar, like like BISC makes a, a tripeer, uh, Ioptron makes a tripeer. I think any of those could be adapted to the solution. The reason being is downward force is not how you collapse one of these things. It's actually upward force used to collapse them. So that lends this to this type of solution. If you have a standard tripod approach, well, downward pressure is how that, that tripod collapses. Now, I'm not saying you couldn't do this, but I haven't, I don't have any experience with it, so I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, if somebody wanted to try it, absolutely try it, experiment, but do a lot of testing uh, and make sure you've, you've got something solid. Um, that Chris, said, I, yes. Uh, can we ask a couple of questions? Absolutely. Somebody asked, uh, have, did you have a telescope as a kid? Um, actually, we did. We did have a telescope as, uh, as kids. I can't remember. I can picture the box it was in, uh, but uh, yeah, my mom had one. I do remember looking at the moon through it, yeah. Have you ever thought on your, uh, your wheelie device, have you thought about adding any weight to the bottom to lower the center of gravity? I have, uh, you, and and one thing I'll say, I I did not, I was not weight conscious on this. In fact, I went the other way. It's like I anywhere where I could make something a little heavier, I did. That that front wheel is extremely heavy. Um, it's a solid steel hub in there. Um, you know, so I mean, looking at this thing, you can see I wasn't going for lightweight. But yeah, I have thought about it. You could definitely use like gym weights or something. Uh, to make this even heavier. I haven't found the need to do it, but if you were to add more weight up top, yeah, I, I would definitely recommend putting more weight on the bottom. Well, I say that because I have a I have a pre-made uh, wheelie arrangement and I put 10 pound lead weights, rectangular weights at, at each intersection and just Velcroed them on just to lower that center of gravity, 30 pounds yep. of lead. Yep. I, I have a question on your levelers. When you've uh, screwed your levelers down, uh, are they metal or are there is there any uh, uh, absorbent material, uh, sorbethane, I think, that, that, that they sell for that kind of purpose? Uh, no, I, I, they are metal. So uh, when I screw this down, uh, it is metal uh, kind of on a ball joint pivot sitting on top of a wood block. Okay. And uh, it looks like everything is um, is wood with a few metal braces. I don't understand the construction up in front where you've got the one pivot wheel. And what is that that attaches the top of that to the to the main tripod? Uh, I, in the picture you've got right here, you can see. Right. Yeah, you're pointing. Are you talking uh, about here? You, you, below that. Below that. Down the, here, the shiny no, no. That's that's just the wheel that you got from uh, uh, Amazon, I think you said. But yep. behind behind that, it looks like a metallic right there. And uh, you went too far. There we go. Right here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, that's wood again. Yeah. What's below that? Right there. Oh, uh, that's that? a four. That's just a four by six block. It's it was weathered from being outdoors because it's pressure treated lumber. Okay, but like it's again, part. it's it's again just lumber. Just lumber. Now I did, this is steel reinforced. Um, for some reason, here's my point. Like here and here I use, I made uh, uh, steel uh, brackets uh, that run the full width here. They're, they're lag bolted in to give that joint uh, just a lot of rigidity. Where is the weld that you had to manufacture? Ah, the weld, yeah, the weld, actually, let's go backwards here. I think it's easier to see. I th and maybe it's forward. I'll I'll point it out when it pops up, Alex. Okay. Yeah. I, it looks like it's all wood construction, a couple of metal plates to for stability and stuff like that. But all correct. Yep. Basically, all wood. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I and and it really came down to a choice of what do I have the tools to do? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I don't I don't have some fancy workshop. I did actually do most of my work in my driveway. You know, I'll wheel. I have a I have a 
table saw and wheels that I wheel out in the driveway, things like that. But I, I don't have a, a nice workshop. Um, so yeah, it was more for practical reasons. No, it looks uh, good. I knew I could do a lot with wood. Chris, can I ask how much uh, this whole assembly costs? Just the, the yeah. Table? So I estimate uh, all the parts to do this were less than four hundred bucks. Not 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 including the eagle, of course. <laughs> and and but, even though you say you you're not a trained engineer, it looks like a fair amount of engineering went into this. Completely accidental. Okay. But yeah, I mean, I, I guess, um, you know, being able to look at, uh, at ones that have already been built and, and getting ideas and then trying to kind of apply that. And truly, the Eagle really sort of inspired the design. I, I, I think that's a true statement. Um, so, so throughout the testing, you know, I just kept adding things on until finally, you know, I got the scope up there and balanced and everything and uh, just kind of maneuvered around uneven ground and things and very cautiously. And then finally, um, you know, to your point, Eric, um, you know, found, the tipping, you know, I deliberately took it and, and found tipping points. So I knew where my limits were. Uh, I just added some accessories to Dolly, you know, the storage box, I've got some uh, uh, solar flat fielders in there and do heaters and cables and whatnot. Um, but a, a, a pretty uh, hefty power supply on there, a 23 amp tech power power supply. Uh, and then I've got my leveling blocks. So what's the result of all this? Um, I've ended up with a very stable, safe way to maneuver gear in and out of the garage. Um, it's easy to level, super convenient. Um, time savings per usage, I'll say, uh, is well over an hour. I would say, you know, till you, till I wheel all my cases out, unpack, assemble, disassemble, put things back in the cases, but it was easily an hour and 15 minutes. Um, increased my usage easily by more than 10, 10 times. Um, I engage with the hobby so much more now uh, and increased my enthusiasm for the hobby exponentially. Um, I can do uh, reconfigurations in the garage way in advance of the session. You know, if I if I want to add in a new component or change something out, you know, I can I can I can kind of bench test it in the garage and make sure everything's working properly well in advance of kind of going out and doing an image imaging session. Um, so it's reduced my troubleshooting and really re reopened imaging for me. Uh, I, to me, you know, astro imaging is is difficult, and if if you don't get the the scope time or the camera time or however you want to say it, you, you just don't improve because uh, you really got to work at this to learn and 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 clear clear some of the hurdles, the early hurdles especially. Um, example of of just what it's done. So January fifteenth, uh, full moon. Clouds were forecast by midnight. I wouldn't have dreamed of going out and setting up and doing any sort of imaging before. I, I took a, a scope out, uh, a little SV80 access, first light with that scope, first uh, uh, imaging through that scope rather. And uh, I got 3.2 hours of exposure time and produced that image. And it's, it's, it's an okay image for me. Uh, you got some blue halos around the stars. We can't figure out why they're there. But other than that, I really like the nebulosity. And uh, all of that on a, a full moon night with clouds uh, coming in. So, uh, and they did come in at midnight. They did chase me. But point being um, is just that's the kind of squeezing in scope time I'm able to do now that I wasn't doing before. All right. So I had the I had the dolly built um, and working uh late winter uh, of 20 uh early early 2021 and uh really really liked it thought it had solved some problems it got me thinking uh what if i could use this to get out to dark skies easier what do i need to do so you know i thought about the trailer thing before um didn't didn't do a lot of research but i started to early last year and uh, came to some, I'm sorry, to some conclusions. Um, I had my outback. I knew I needed 
something that I could pull with the out back and also that the dolly would have to fit in it and be able to roll up the ramp. Um, uh, again, I looked at stability and safety as being number one. I had to be able to tow this thing safely, you know, haul the gear safely uh, and load and unload safely. Uh, the toy hauler concept, um, you know, really comes down to having a trailer with a ramp door. Uh, and, and, you know, I knew I needed to keep it simple and affordable. Um, I started to think about, yeah, and if I'm going to be inside of it, I need to be able to stand up, so I got to have headroom. So that started kind of giving me some of the dimensions um, of this trailer, and it turns out there 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 aren't a lot this size out there. Um, this thing is six; it's a six by eight V nose. Uh, the stand up room is six and a half feet, so I've got plenty of headroom inside that thing. Um, and then uh, I also started to think about potential for some type of finished interior uh, working space, that type of thing. And uh, one of the things you have to know with these cargo trailers, if you intend to occupy it at all, you got to have what's called an RV door, which is the side door over here. Without that, there's just no way to occupy it because you can't close this door from the inside and be in it, right? So, um, so that kind of set my uh, uh, search criteria for it. And I, I actually found one not too far away uh, in uh, Frankfurt, Ohio. So it was about maybe a 80, 90 minute drive to, to pick it up and bring it home. And that was me picking it up that day. Proud new owner. Um, and I got it home. And of course, the first thing I needed to do is see, does this work? You know, Because <laughs> if it doesn't, it's got to go back to the dealer 90 minutes. Um, and so this was sort of my uh, thank goodness it works moment, uh, was able to safely load the, the fully uh, assembled dolly with scope uh, into the trailer, tie it down securely. Um, so that got me thinking, what can I do with a six foot by eight foot space? Um, so I spent some time just sitting inside the thing and visualizing different layouts and what have you. And uh, what I ended up thinking I could do was a workstation, uh, a warm room, a place to sleep, a place to cook and eat, a place to relax and stay organized. And of course, there were lots of ideas that didn't make the cut. So, uh, so that kind of led me to... Uh, sort of the feature list, like, all right, so what do I need to uh, source and consider how I'm going to, to construct it? Uh, so um, I knew I needed to insulate it. Um, power ventilation, you know, being able to move air through it, um, the power and outlets, astro-friendly lighting, some durable flooring, uh, a stable footprint. I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, some type of fold-away bed, uh, cargo wall, place to organize things, finish the interior, desk, countertop, storage facets, computer monitor, um, a microwave, a way to keep people from stealing it, and uh, some type of wireless network, because uh, I want to be able to image remotely. Uh, so I think uh, most penal systems around the world have uh, discontinued use of large, putting people in large metal boxes as a form of punishment. So I knew if I was going to occupy this thing, I would need some way uh, to make it comfortable. You absolutely have to insulate these things. Uh, the minute the sun hits it, it's going to start to heat up. Uh, it's amazing how fast it can heat up. Once you insulate, that problem essentially goes away. Um, so you can make these spaces occupy, obviously they do it with RVs, uh, you can do it with a, a cargo trailer. Um, so I used one inch foam board insulation in uh, the walls and the ceiling, uh, two inch foam board underneath. Um, this picture here is actually a view of the underside of the trailer where I, I kind of glued the foam board up between the, the beams that hold the floor. Um, the, the ceiling I paid even more attention to, I put a little additional insulation right across the beams on the ceiling, just because that they transmit uh, the solar energy really, really effectively. And so I needed to insulate that extra. Uh, power ventilation, I uh, ended up going with a 12 volt, fantastic. It's a reversible fan, so it'll blow air in or blow, suck air out. Um, that was a, a birthday present from my daughter, Jill. Thank you, Jill. And uh, 
this is what it looks like finished on the outside. Um, so I, I'm not an electrician and I kind of wimped out. I, I didn't want to just, you know, try to learn 110 volt wiring um, on the fly here. So uh, I found the, the cheater's way to do it. You know, everything is kind of extension cords and plugs ready made, but it, it worked fine. It worked good. And uh, it was, uh, it was kind of fun sourcing all the parts here. But basically, I bring one, 110 in through the, this outlet I installed on the outside comes in through this junction box. I'm able to split it there with a, a, a cord splitter. And uh, then I have two of these units installed on the walls. These have two 110 outlets and then three 5.1 volt uh, USB outlets in them. I think they're uh, for like conference room tables. They just kind of sit down inside recessed in the table. Um, I also put a 12 volt uh, uh, converter in here. And then uh, I, I've got a uh, power pole uh, strip here to distribute the 12 volt for the fan and the, the lighting. And then, you know, it's all kind of contained in this little junction box uh, in the corner. Um, Astro friendly lighting. Uh, a lot of uh, folks probably already know this. I, I discovered them on my own. These are uh, little uh, gooseneck um, USB lights that will give either white light or red light. Um, so they were great because you kind of put light right where you need it on your counter space. And then I had a, a, a boat light here that's white or red as well. So I'm able to do all red light inside of it to preserve night vision. Uh, for the flooring, I ended up going with this uh, vinyl diamond plate. Um, it's glued down. Um, it's quite durable. What I discovered uh, a little too late is that if you install it on a hot summer day and you leave it outside while you're cutting it, uh, it does expand. And then when you glue it down and you close it up for the night while the glue dries, that ex it contracts and it leaves a nice seam down where, where none was before. So this is sort of the, the one mistake that I, uh, I never really fixed because you can't. When you came back out, it was already glued. I'm like, oh, well. It's, it's, it's an open seam, but it actually is a pretty nice flooring material. It's easy to clean and sweep out, what have you, uh, and it's quite durable. Um, it, it does get a bit slippery, so I put these uh, non-skid tape down, um, you know, so you don't slip and fall on the ramp, and uh, uh, also had kind of some outreach potential in mind, and like you don't want John or Jane Q Public uh, slipping and falling on your, your trailer ramp. Um, if you look here, you'll see it's a, it's a three point, right? It's not a dual axle trailer. So with the ramp down, if you put enough weight on that ramp, this will pop up in the air. <laughs> um, so, uh, it was essential to kind of install these, uh, uh, stabilizer jacks on the back and they're just manual jacks. They're spring loaded. You just pop them down and they, they, they snap into place. Uh, and then the height is adjustable on them. Uh, and uh, that works really good. Uh, I can level the trailer a little bit when I'm in a, in a camp spot, you know, and uh, uh, get a nice level floor inside as well as a stable uh, platform. This was by far the hardest part of the project, uh, the bed. Uh, so initially I had designed a, a wooden bed uh, with hinges and all sorts of elaborate uh, supports and what have you, uh, and uh, had it on paper and I, I molded over and I, I decided I'm going to see if there's something ready made that uh, is probably lighter and perhaps cheaper than it would be to build this. So started looking around. There really isn't a whole lot out there, but there was a company that makes these fold down bunks for RV uh, use. And uh, I found a dealer who would who was willing to sell me one. And uh, it was drop shipped out of where else? Elkhart, Indiana. That's where all things RV seem to come from. And, uh, but it, it arrived and it was all, just all the metal parts in a box, with no instructions and not even a good picture. <laughs> so uh, this was a trick to sort of measure everything out and figure out where to put it. Uh, it's not a simple hinge fold up. It, it, it folds and, and also partly slides down the wall. 
to, to change its position. So a little complicated on the mechanism and then the measurements were just crazy to figure out. Um, but I did finally figure out where it needed to go. And of course, as you might imagine, the steel braces inside the trailer wall, of course, don't line up to where you need to screw it fast and you can't just screw that into wood, it has to go into metal. So I had to custom make uh, steel braces to go inside the walls. Uh, so I could screw this thing fast. It cantilevers out. This is uh, spec'd out to hold, I think, 300 plus pounds. Um, and, uh, you know, when all is said and done, it's lightweight, it's comfortable, it folds up out of the way. Here, you can kind of see it's not in the way of any of the cargo. It locks into place, so it's never in danger of falling down and hitting anything. Uh, it's really kind of a, a, a cool feature. The trailer and best of all it's got a custom gel foam mattress that just sleeps great so i get i get good sleep when i'm when i'm out there in the field i'll pause again if there's any questions all right i've got I went, but remember it takes us a second or three to oh, get okay. you sorry <laughs> um oh when you fold your bed down can you have your telescope in the in the trailer i cannot and um that is the reason for <laughs> the scope covers. Uh, so, you know, if, if, if inclement weather does arrive, I, I've got to batten down the hatches outside um, or fold the bed up and, and make the best of the situation. But yes, good question. Nope, there's not enough room to have the bed and the scope. I think if I'd have gone for the next size out, which is a wider seven footer, um, it, it would have worked that, that out that way, but it just was too big a trailer for the for the outback to pull. And okay. of, of course, we're going to ask you what the the whole trailer fitted out uh, costs. I mean, you don't have to share that, but I'm sure people are now thinking, do I need to get one of those? And if so, what would it cost? Yeah, so, um, you know, a lot of it's going to depend on how it's configured when you buy it, but I think you you can expect to pay for something this size uh, between I'd say 3,400 up to maybe as high again in this size range, maybe as high as six or seven thousand, depending how it's outfitted. Um, my particular model was four grand, um, and. I probably in the in the construction materials and everything I needed to kind of finish it off, uh, you could, a little less than two. So the whole thing uh, is under six, which you, know, you cannot touch uh, uh, an RV, a small compact RV like this for probably under thirteen, I would guess. So probably about the same cost as your Mach 1. <laughs> yeah. OK. All right. Oh, how so, long did it take? Vincent Trasati wants to know, how long did it take you to build all this? Ah, uh, hi, Vincent. Um, it, I started the end of, uh, or the beginning of April. Uh, and I finished it up in the middle of October. So about six months. During COVID time. During COVID time. And uh, Mike points out that he, uh, a fitted out trailer is about 20,000. Yeah, um, so yeah, some of the toy haulers I I drooled over are definitely in the upwards $30,000 range. Um, and they're, I mean, they're wonderful kitchen, bath, uh just really nice spaces magnificent features but uh you know someday uh when when i think that, that like that's mostly what i do i think it's worth that investment but i just just didn't want to make it at this point okay i think that's the questions for now cool um so uh in in shopping and looking at cargo trailers um I ran across this thing called an e-track system, uh, kind of a popular feature nowadays. Um, the landscapers love them. Uh, in a larger uh, cargo trailer, they're they're handy to have installed on the floor because you can change the configuration of your tie down. So if you're you're, you're tying down multiple uh, uh, 
uh, motorcycles or ATVs or uh, lawn equipment or whatever it is you're doing, you can, you can configure the tie downs different ways. I decided to do uh, a wall on one of the Vino's walls that with this to kind of organize things. I mean, I've got an observing chair, I've got a desk chair, I've got, you know, all this other gear that I want to haul along. And this is a way to kind of secure it and then stay organized when you're parked. Anybody who's ever camped in an RV knows that number one thing you got to get good at is organizing yourself because your space is so limited um, and your stuff is not. <laughs> so, uh, so this was my idea of, of staying organized. And these things are cool because you get these clipping uh, uh, different uh, appliances that you can kind of put in here to hook stuff into and whatnot. Um, so that was the cargo wall. Uh, and then finish, I mentioned finished interior. So I bought this trailer with a partially finished interior, uh, not finished, but roughed interior. So it came with a lot of the wall, like the wall lumber and a lot of the trim was already there. Uh, now, of course I had to take all that out in order to insulate it and everything, but I carefully labeled it all. So I knew where it goes and where to put it back in. Um, and then, uh, uh, I did have to fabricate the ceiling and some other things, but uh, I, I would recommend it if you're thinking of a project like this. I, I, I really like the fact that the walls were kind of already done and uh, just had to kind of modify it. The uh, uh, kind of the finishing touches coming in here, the desk, the counter, baskets, uh, the monitor and the microwave. Um, so I, I built these, this, Countertop fits nicely next to the bed. The bed can fold down the counter. It fits right alongside the counter. Uh, gives me a working surface to kind of prepare food and things like that. Um, the desk, of course, where my workstation is, um, I use these, these just these folding brackets. They're great. They're really solid. Um, that was an Amazon find as well. Um, I got this 27-inch uh, curved monitor from Sam, Samsung. It's awesome. It's great for kind of the up-close working uh, that I'm doing there. Um, and then I just put in a little Toshiba microwave and uh, just like home. Um, here's some just some shots of the workstation. Uh, so for remote imaging, this is this is what I'm dealing with. Uh, it's pretty sweet. And then, um, you know, I was told these, these things are targets for theft. Um, I guess they're pretty easy to steal. Uh, so, you know, I put some thought into it. Um, I like the idea of this, uh, putting this big old kryptonite, forget about it, lock around the, the, the wheel. Um, so yeah, you might be able to hitch it up, but you ain't going anywhere with it. Uh, and um, I got these light keyed locks for all the, the, the trailer doors. Um, got a locking hitch on the car. So just, you know, trying to present, if somebody wants to steal something and they're a professional thief, it's going to be gone anyhow, but I don't use it as a, I use it as a conveyance, not as a storage locker for my astronomy gear. So, um, you know, I'll limit my risk there a little bit. Uh, Wi-Fi networking, uh, you know, Wi-Fi is, kind of my friend and my enemy. It's my friend because it lets me do things remotely. It's my enemy because sometimes it's finicky. Um, I, uh, I have two Wi-Fi routers that I use uh, depending what I'm trying to do. The one on the left is, a, is a, just a little uh, travel router. The cool thing about it is it can, you can tether an iPhone to it. So if I'm out at a, a, a remote site and I can get a cell signal, I can actually have internet access through this router. Uh, the not so cool thing is the signal's not as great as the one on the right, which is uh, just uh, one of the mesh units from a TP-Link Deco mesh system. Um, the surprising thing about this is I found out it actually can work standalone out in the field. Um, I found that out when I had one of these go bad in the field. And the only thing I had with me was this, and it kind of saved the day. So, uh, But I tend to use the mesh at home and the travel router uh, when I'm away. Uh, securing the cargo. All right. So this, this is, 
this is really rubber meets road. This is what it's all about. Can I get my stuff safely where it's going? Um, four point tie downs at the corners, those come stock in any cargo trailer. Um, what again, the Eagle, the inspiration, the, um, the Eagle pier, the center part uh, comes pre-drilled with all these nice three eighths inch holes in, in solid aluminum. So I was able to put, put these three eighths eye hooks, eye bolts right where I wanted them. I didn't have to do any modification. The holes were just right in the right spot. Um, and then uh, got some nice tie down straps. Um, and uh, so, yeah, everything travels very securely. So one thing I do, a couple of things I do before I, before I take off, I make sure that all my saddle clamps are wrench tightened and any of the kind of things that fasten or create any of this vertical structure here, wrench tightened. Uh, vibration will loosen, as we all know, will loosen things pretty quickly. So I don't take any chances with that. Um, I also loosen um, the clutches on the mount and then I lightly bungee the axes of the mount um, to, the, to the pier itself. Uh, so what that gives you is it's not going to wildly swing out of the way, but it can kind of move loosely if it needs to. So if you hit a bump or something like that, you're not getting uh, the, the force on the gears that you would if your clutches were, were tight. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. Um, that, that I'm going to pause there again because I the folks that think might have questions about this part. Um, what do you... Uh, what are you using to control your mount and stuff like that? Um, great question. I, I'm, I'm going to get to that in a minute. So if you hold okay. the question, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, mainly just because uh, um, I'm trying to figure out how to do non-internet networking out in the field. Because um, I, I use a little Intel Nook to run my stuff. And I'm trying to figure out how to connect yep. to it without internet. <laughs> yep. Okay. Chris, you ever think about putting a video camera in the back and so you could watch it from the front in case things move around? I haven't. Um, I, I guess that's a that's a, a, a leap of faith. Uh, if I will say this, if I was doing any, I, so I've only done um, 90 minute trips to dark sky sites uh, that our club uh, has. Uh, so I, I'm fortunate enough in the Cincinnati Astronomical Society, we have uh, two dark sky sites that are uh, both within 90 minutes of my house. So, and both have uh, power that I can connect into. You know, a, um, an inexpensive alternative to the, having a video back there. You say you got four grandkids, one of them, put them back in there and let them ride along and just report. <laughs> With a walkie talkie, right? <laughs> <laughs> they would love that. <laughs> slow down, grandpa, slow down, grandpa. <laughs> Well, I was thinking if, you know, you're traveling and you hit this big bump unexpectedly, you're probably thinking, oh, what's going on back there? Yeah, I would stop and check for sure. I would periodically check all those uh, saddle clamps and everything as well if I was doing any kind of long distance, which which I hope to do. Tim, Tim McCallum, asks, uh, McCallum asks only one door. Uh, I mean, you've got the big back one and then that passenger door up front. Right. Yeah, the RV door up front and the, the big back door, the ramp door. When you're working back there, you've closed up the ramp. Yes. Yep, the ramp closes up, uh, as you can see here, you know, just forms the back wall. Uh, did you tell us about any heat you have back there? Uh, I haven't talked about heat, um, but I, right now I'm just using a plug-in uh, small ceramic heater. And, and it, it does a great job. I mean, I, I can get it nice and toasty in there, um, but it is electric and I do have to be plugged in for it. So I'll, I'll touch a little bit on kind of future, uh, future state, what I might want to do there. Yeah. All right. Yep, we got um, it, we're clear now. So what, if, what about uh, financial risk, right? So I got this all tied in, everything's going to be great, right? But gee, you are hurtling down the road, uh, uh, you've got your telescope case on wheels going at about 60 miles an hour. Um, what do you, you know, how do you kind of offset the financial risk? Well, I would argue anytime you take your gear off your property, 
um, you probably need to think about that. So um, I've got a personal articles policy uh, on my astronomy gear. Um, it's listed as, um, it's, it's scheduled as camera equipment. And you do have to kind of list out each item that you want to ensure on a personal articles policy, but that is all risk inland marine coverage. Um, so basically, unless you're intentionally damaging something, it's covered under that policy. And then uh, I also have a trailer policy, which I think cost me a whopping $24 a year, gives me physical damage coverage just for the trailer. So um, I, I think that's that's uh, the extent of what you can do to, uh, to cushion the financial risk. So with the building out of the way and the risk transfer all figured out and everything's battened down and so, okay, let's play, let's have some fun, right? So get out um, and uh, this, this is where the, the real fun begins is you, 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 get, you get the thing, you wheel it out, set it up, I'm ready to go in, in probably 15 minutes. This is one of our dark sky club sites um, that I, I was fortunate enough, I finished it in October. So I was fortunate enough to get some of these beautiful fall days. I mean, you can just see how blue the sky is there. Uh, and uh, really kind of take it out for, for a test run. Uh, so some of the different rigs um, I, I run here. Uh, here you're gonna see uh, a Prima Lucha Lab Eagle. Um, I tried this out for about 10 months. I finally gave up. I, it just didn't work for me. Uh, it may be because I had the entry level one. Uh, I didn't. I didn't buy up to the the big bad uh, top of the line eagle, but I just had so many problems with uh, stability of the network and stability of the operating system that I threw in the towel. Uh, and um, so so I replaced it with uh, a uh, Pegasus Ultimate Power Box version two and a B Link uh, Mini PC. So that's how I'm controlling everything. Uh, and I haven't looked back. Uh, those two pieces of gear work very, very well, uh, and I'm very happy with them. Again, your mileage may vary. And you know, anytime I complain about hardware, it's probably uh, operator error. So just throw that out. Um, this config, uh, I have like my Lunt 4 inch. Uh, I use a point gray grasshopper with the 174 chip in it. I've got a, a solar scintillation monitor and a Hanode uh, solar guider. So the solar guider allows me to uh, carefully uh, track the sun, even though I may not be perfectly polar or aligned. Uh, and the scintillation monitor I'm using to control the shutter on the 174 so that it only uh, collects data when the, the sky is at its calmest uh, given the current conditions. Uh, I'll also point out I am able to run the solar rig on solar power. So that's kind of cool. Uh, only in solar image, imaging can you do that, but I, I can actually run my rig on solar power. Um, that's a hundred watt panel and I have a little um, uh, Jackery uh, battery that I run with that. Um, I've also got the, the Zeiss APQ 130 um, set up to do solar. Uh, I have a Botter Surf on it. Uh, it's a cool energy rejection filter up here. Um, and then a, a 4X telecentric, which puts me at F30. And then uh, at the back here, I've got a, a solar spectrum modified T-scanner. So T-scanner was originally made by uh, Daystar, um, I think back in the 90s. And uh, they must have been made for use only in Southern California because they only work when the temperature is about 72 degrees, I think. Uh, but Mark Wagner at Solar Spectrum he actually made these things originally. He used to work for Daystar back in the day. And uh, he knew this particular one by serial number that he had actually made it. And he said he could modify it for me. So he did a mod on it. It has a tech oven on it. So it, it, uh, it cools or heats it depending on what it needs. And you can control all that from this box here. And, they, and he left the tilt controller on it too. So I've got a lot of ways to kind of tune the Edelon at the back here. I like that setup a lot. 
And then you see I have the uh, kind of the dark box here for, for controlling. Uh, I can put my iPad in here and be able to see it in a sunny day. Uh, and then for Deep Sky, um, I've been using uh, my APQ 130 with uh, uh, an ASI 2600 MC Pro. Um, and at the time that this was taken, I was using an Explore Scientific Field Flattener. I was just trying it. Uh, the, the APQ was made back in the early 90s, early to mid 90s, and there was no dedicated flattener for it. Um, it was intended to be a visual scope. It is a oil space triplet. So I imagine if I can get the right flattener on it, it's just going to be incredible uh, as a five inch refractor. Uh, but I have yet to find the right flattener for it. So it's, it's a trial and error process. So I'm on my second trial. So um, we'll see what happens. And so meanwhile, while I'm on the second trial, I'm still kind of gathering parts to do that. Uh, I, I pulled out my Access 80, which I have a dedicated flattener for. Again, the 2600 MC Pro. And um, uh, yeah, here's a, here's a good shot of the, the B-Link and the, the Pegasus on there. And this is just a, a buck converter on the back because this particular B-Link wants 19 volts. It's not happy with 12. Uh, and I like to try uh, different stuff. I think a lot of us do like to experiment. So um, but, uh, actually, I learned about it on this show, uh, the Astro Mechanics uh, Canon Lens Adapter that allows you to control the focus motors. So experimenting with that. Um, in the center here, I've got an old mini Borg uh, with a, a, one of these Omegon uh, mini tracks, which is a, a, a wind-up drive. Uh, it'll, it'll go on the, on the spring wind-up for about an hour and uh, then a Canon T5i on it. Over here, uh, I'm double stacking the uh, solar spectrum uh, modified T-scanner with my four inch LUNT. Uh, and this is also a double stack configuration here built around the mini board uh, with a little 40, uh, solar max 40 on the front here. Um, let me, uh, I'm gonna jump out real quick and just kind of look at kind of what am I doing with this thing? Um, wait, here we go. So I like to do the solar animations. Um, they're a lot of fun. It's kind of like unwrapping a, a present at Christmas time. You don't know what you got until you get it in the digital darkroom and you're processing the frames and you can actually see the time lapse motion. Um, so they're a lot of fun. Um, this was my first remote imaging uh, result. So I actually did this from the comfort of my office while the scope was out back doing the hard work. Uh, here is another animation uh, in black and white. This one, you'll notice the philoprom kind of running across here and the wisps of uh, plasma coming off the active region there. Um, this is, uh, NGC 7822. I do use a Optolong uh, L enhance filter when I'm imaging from the backyard. Uh, there's another time lapse uh, on a prominence. A lot of good detail in this one. Showed that already. Uh, here's the butterfly uh, shot from a dark sky site. I wish I could figure out how to get rid of those blue halos. Uh, some lunar stuff that's uh, Mare Chrysium. This I did about two weeks ago. Uh, it's an active region that's uh, still going round and round there. Chris, how narrow is your Edelon, your T-scanner? The T-scanner, uh, Mark said it was a, a 0.6. And your GIF, your animations are GIF animations in Photoshop? Yes, they are. Yep, uh, I'm using uh, the, mostly the method that uh, Warren Spring had uh, shown on this show. Uh, 
Uh, M45, again, shot from uh, Dark Sky site. Uh, um, this was actually a project they did, multi-night imaging from the backyard using the Allen Hans and uh, actually even got the soap bubble to show up in it, which I thought was pretty cool. And uh, the witch head, again, from uh, Dark Sky, that's from a Dark Sky site. This was actually my first image, uh, eyes closed imaging, where I trusted everything enough to kind of go to sleep. It was kind of neat. So um, jump back over here. Uh, what's next? So looking at the spring, um, I'm thinking I want to put in a one of these magnetic screen doors on that RV door, so just so I can move air in in the warmer months of the year and stay comfortable out there. Um, I may put in a pull-out step under that RV door door because it's kind of a big step up uh, and I'm contemplating some kind of doing some kind of dark sky safari I haven't decided where or how long or any of that but I, I really feel inspired I want to do it uh, longer term might go with some propane tanks on the trailer uh, so I can do propane heat possibly even a propane generator for some off-grid power um, these are just some ideas I'm kicking around and uh what astrophotographer does not have a gear short list, wish list? Uh, I have not met one yet. Uh, so mine's a flattener solution for my APQ uh, and a short, fast triplet astrograph. Uh, and then longer term, you know, maybe get into some mono uh, cam CMOS camera, maybe even a full frame um, camera. So I call that the end of the beginning uh, because I really feel like I have kind of hit the reset button. Uh, my enthusiasm is really high now. Um, I feel like I've got all the tools I need to really start to conquer the learning curve in this fascinating hobby. So um, yeah, here we go. So any further questions? I I think we've got all the questions that are over in chat, except the one that's coming over in acrylic. Um, don't know what that says. And uh, got a couple of people expressing their appreciation for you. So it's good. Um, I did have a question, but I think you caught it. I had a question of my own. So that looks good. Yeah, you should really uh, head out to one of the big star parties out to. Um, you know, Texas Star Party or Okie Tex, um, well, winter apparently got canceled, but you know, that's where that that's where I think you'd really pay off with all that stuff that you got there that you built up. It'd be yeah, nice. Cherry, Cherry Springs isn't too far from me. Um, I think yeah. I could probably get over there in a day's drive. Uh, that comes up, I think, end of May, beginning of June. Come on, dude, a day? With that thing, you could go out for like, um, you know, a month. No, I've had a day's drive. Oh, okay. A day's drive, but yeah, yeah I know, no, but you I, could go I for a long time. You know, take uh, a safari. I I, really... I dream of New Mexico. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, West Virginia is really good as well. The um, Green Bank Star Quest and Almost Heaven Star Party, they're a lot closer than, than Pennsylvania, actually. Um, mm -hmm. And it's real dark out there. Excellent. What What months are those, Molly? Uh, Green Bank is in July. I think almost heavens in August. I'd have to go double check. Aren't there a couple of cherry? Uh, cherry what is it? Cherry Springs. They do two. They, there's Black Forest and Cherry Springs, and uh, they're at the same park um, I, or in the same area. Um, I think uh, they're at two different times a year. I have to go check the dates on mm -hmm. them. Two different organizations. I really don't know. I. I'm a West Coaster, but I've always wanted to go back there during one of those times. I try to make all the big star parties at one point or another in my life. So, Chris, you didn't tell us what kind of software you use for data collection and any automation yet? Um, so I, uh, I was an APT guy for a little while, and then um, I decided to bite the bullet and switch over to Nina. Uh, the first month was uh, pretty traumatic, but uh, after that, I never look back. I, I use Nina for just about everything now. Um, 
How often do you sleep through the night while it's working? Um, almost all the time. Yeah. So I, I enjoy the process. So I'll, I'll spend hours in the evening, you know, hunched over the monitor. Just do you have another? Do you have another telescope you take with us to or take with you to do astronomy while you're astroimaging? I have not advanced to that point yet, but when mm -hmm. I do, I do have uh, some small grab and go stuff that I can take along. But uh, I, I'm still at that intensely babysitting everything part of the the learning curve. But mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, I'll advance beyond that and can, you know, I've heard Molly talk about running multiple rigs in a night and that kind of thing. <laughs> I can't imagine. Okay. It's pretty great. Uh, I run three rigs on a regular basis now, and at star parties, I run five. <laughs> and then, and then occasionally she walks around and visits with everybody else. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I'm getting faster and faster at getting my stuff set up. Um, and uh, there was one time I took my Paramount Mighty out to a dark sky site, and I was up and running. I think like 45 minutes after sunset with no no issues on the first go around so that was very exciting that is exciting <laughs> it yeah it's taken a lot of work together <laughs> okay, well i mean see. and that's the point right is is you have to get out there and do this and you know the hobby can really work against you if you're only if you're only an occasional astro imager you're never gonna you're never gonna clear clear the hill and um, so I think that's what I've solved. I think I've solved the frequency problem. And uh, that helps us, that helps solve the enjoyment problem, right? And so sooner or later, you start to produce real results. And so I feel like I'm on the right road now and that this solution has helped me get here, so. Have you got any others... of your family involved in this? Do they go out with you at all? Um, I, my, my youngest daughter has voiced, uh, uh, desire to go. Um, she's waiting for dad. She was waiting for dad to work all the kinks out of it. So <laughs> I think maybe this may be the year for, her. uh, so that'll be fun. How do, Larry, Larry Groom wants to know, um, how you connect to the telescope outside from the laptop inside. Um, so, so I'm setting up, uh, a Wi-Fi network. Uh, again, either with with that little travel router, or I've found that the the mesh unit will set it up its own network um, without any uh, sort of internet connection. It will do it. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, it, either the travel router or the mesh router sets up a, and, an internet. And, and, and that's sit that's sitting inside the trailer. It just goes um, through the walls, etc. No, I've actually found that it works best if I put it under the trailer. Okay. Because the floor, hey. the floor is wood. The walls are all metal. The ceiling's metal. So, but the floor is wood. So it passes signal better, um, and and it'll still kind of got a shot out to the to the dolly as well. So um, okay. I found that's my best setup. And are you using like a Windows RDP or something? Yes, Re Windows Remote Desktop to remote into the the B you. you do you have an eagle or a, or a mini out there outside or what? Um, I have a mini PC on the scope, uh, a yeah, B-Link okay. mini PC on the scope. Yep. And then your your regular computer inside. Mike uh, wanted to point out that Cherry Springs is in early June and Black Forest is in early October. And I think they're at the same site. I think that's what the point is. Okay. I think that is about does it for the night. Any other questions? Um, and Matthew points out to wish everybody got together on the connections that we all had. And anyway, um, uh, I want to thank you all for being here. Remember, we take the week off next week because of the football game and uh, American football game. And then we are going to, um, we'll see you again a week after that when. Um, Reg will be coming in here to tell us about tandem imaging, I believe. I forget, I forgot to write it down before the show. Um, so we'll be here. We'll be back together. So if we could get all the people on the Astro Imaging channel to wave, bye-bye. Goodbye, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Molly, I think you're in charge, so you can take I us am. out. All right.